Good morning and welcome to HEC TV Live. We're here at St. James the Greater School in St. Louis, Missouri for today's program Inside the Artist Studio and Interactive Workshop with author Ridley Pearson. We're very glad that we've got kids from across the country joining us, states across the country via video conference and the internet today. A couple of our schools will be joining us interactively. These kids here at St. James the Greater will have the chance to be interactive participants as well. We are very excited about this unique opportunity to give your students a chance to see what it's like to learn from a guy who gets to write every day, which is something, of course, that all of these kids want to do too, right? Yeah. Excellent answer, St. James the Greater. Mr. Pearson is immediately excited, as are, of course, your teachers who are sitting in the back of the room. I am noticing that they're smiling broadly now. We look forward to everybody enjoying today's show, and so without much further ado at all, let's bring in Ridley Pearson. Hi guys, I just want to show you an example of critical thinking. If you have goggles on, you are a critical thinker. Um, so I'm going to put mine up like this. Uh, when I was 18, which was a few centuries ago, um, I had this amazing opportunity to travel overseas with an American friend of mine. His mom and dad lived in uh, Bangkok, Thailand, and which is you know half a world away from here. And they, uh, he was building, uh, I think he was building airports or something at the time for a big American conglomerate. And they had, you know, four or five maids and servants and a chauffeur. It was like, you know, moving into a palace. And my friend and I hung out a bunch, and at some point, uh, his mom thought it would be fun if we went on a trip. So they decided to take me on a trip up to the northwest section of Thailand. And in those days, believe it or not, we went by train. We could have flown, but she wanted to show me the country, so we went by train. And in those days, it was a steam locomotive, um, you know, with the cattle catcher up front and the coo -choo -coo -coo -choo -coo and the steam coming out of it. Uh, it wasn't even a diesel, much less electric or anything like that. So we pile into this old, old train, this old steam locomotive. It's powered by wood. This, this skinny guy chucks wood into a fire section and that boils the water and the water makes the steam and the steams drive the pistons and this thing goes ripping through the Asian countryside. So we go through all these rice paddies, it's just beautiful for the first day and we spend the night in the town, it's a two day trip, true story, and um, when we come back the next morning there are all these soldiers around our train, our train's been sitting there all night, it's called sidetracked. And we, we don't know why there's like a hundred soldiers, and, and uh, who here is like 12 or 13 years old? Okay, so these soldiers were like 12 or 13 years old, uh, and they had Uzis, automatic weapons. So it would be terrifying to walk into this room and see you guys with Uzis, uh, especially with the uniforms on. But they were there to protect us, or maybe to protect a car they had added onto the train. They were sort of around this car, and the buzz went around <laughs> the rest of us who were passengers that this car was either filled with gold or weapons because they were protecting it so carefully. So it came time to leave, and about 50 of these maybe 200 soldiers stayed on our train with us, all standing there with their guns. Of course, they're little guys, and um, it was a little disturbing. And off we go. Well, the second day on this train trip, uh, goes into the foothills of the foothills of the Himalayas. So it gets steeper and steeper, and we go out of the rice area and into jungle, and it's smoldering hot. It had to be 105 degrees. It's like 90% humidity. Um, all of us are, you know, soaking wet. And you get into that rhythm in a train, you know, it's going chicka tick chicka tick chicka tick chicka tick chicka tick chicka You guys know the story, the little train that could? Well, I ended up on the little train that couldn't. Um, this thing's going chugga dooka chugga dooka chugga dooka chugga dooka, and all of a sudden you you hear it going chugga dooka chugga dooka chugga dooka chugga, and you're going that doesn't quite sound right. And then it goes chugga dooka chugga dooka chugga dooka, <laughs> and it just stops. And we're on this incline like this. I mean, it's really steep, and the train has just stopped. And we kind of rock, and it backs up, and it backs up 20 minutes back down to where it's flat. And they get up this huge head of steam. And 
and it stops again. And we're stuck on the same, about the same spot on this mountain overpass. And the guys with the Uzis, the kids with the Uzis, come through the car, the train car, and they say, all men to get off train. And we said, excuse me, we bought tickets, all men to get off train. So we get off the train, 200 of us. And I'm thinking they're going to line us up out there and shoot us all to make the train lighter. Um, the train backs up again, and that, that plume of steam gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. It's gone. Way, way down the mountain. And they tell all of us, who are now drenching wet, out in the jungly, it was just thick Asian jungle, um, to sand the tracks, to put friction onto the tracks to give the train a better chance to get up and over this pass. So we are paying customers, and we're out there in the blazing sun, taking rocks and banging them together to crumble them into sand. And we're spread out maybe three quarters of a mile up and over the top of this mountain pass. And finally, you know, before all the bullets started raining, we see the, the white little plume of smoke coming back, and it's like, yes! And it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's ah, get it, 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 and it's clearly going to stop again. And the soldiers say, push train over mountain. <laughs> so we literally grab onto these handrails, 200 of us, and we walk the train up and over the peak of this mountain. That is what writing a novel is like. That's what I do every single day. It looks like this beautiful day. My train starts to slow down. I have to figure out some way to get out there and push my plot or my characters or whatever over the top of the mountain. So how do you do that? How do you put a story together? You observe, report, and edit, which is really imagining a story, writing the story, and rewriting and revising the story. So the, these skills, observation, writing, and editing are all equally important. We always think that we just sit down and sort of write a story. I plan my stories, and every writer does, whether he or she admits it. Some of us do it on paper, some of us do it in our heads, but we plan stories. So I need to test your powers of observation. You've got pieces of paper. Everybody in Slater and Berkeley, get out your pieces of paper. Everybody everywhere, get out your pieces of paper because this is going to go quick. Now you have to look at the screen. I'm not going to give you long once I do this, okay? What you're going to do is scan with your eyes across the images that you see on the screen, and then I'm going to take it off of there, and you are going to write down the various images you saw, <laughs> as many as you can. You don't need to do them in any order. Doesn't matter about that. It's just as many of the images you can remember. This is the power of observation. I spend most of my time, when I'm not writing, out taking notes, whether it's mental or physical notes, because we write about what's out there. Then we typically see what's out there and twist it into our own story, and then we write it down. And that's the process. So these skills of observation are really, really important. So here is your puzzle to decipher. So write down the ones you remember. And there they are. I'm not going to give you long, so scan it, check it out, and they're gone. So you're writing down as many as you can remember. Does anybody know how many there were in total? How many were there total? 15. There you go. How did you know that? Well, I saw right on. That's math. There you go. And let's raise hands. Or somebody tell me one of the items they saw in the back. A person walking. A person walking would be correct. And over there in the back, right there. 
A pine tree. A pine tree. So we have two of them. Uh, anybody else? A puzzle piece. A puzzle piece. We have three of them. A bird. A bird flying. We have four of them. A paper clip. A paper clip would make five of them. You guys are excellent. A bike. A bike would be correct. That would be six of them. Um, an envelope. An envelope would, but boy, you guys checked out the bottom. You guys are amazing. Seven. A clock. Eight. I'm totally blown away. An umbrella. Nine. Can we pull in, Tim, can we pull in anybody from, you bet, go ahead and ask them. From uh, right in Berkeley? Let's yeah, anybody in Berkeley. in Berkeley? Can you give me one or two? Lightning. Lightning would be another. What are we up to, like 10? I'm completely shocked because usually there's about five that you guys can and get. And Berkeley, do you guys have a second one? A key. A key? A key would be correct. Ooh, well done. There's Slater? We're almost going to do this whole thing, you guys. Slater, let's go. I'm to just going to have to leave because you're too good. Slater, you have any? Come in, Slater. Do we even know if Slater exists, guys? Yeah. I think they're pulling out. They say it, Chloe. A light bulb? A light bulb? Uh, that would be true. Well done, Slater. Oh, there's Slater. Hi, Slater. Well done. Hi, Slater. Very good. And Slater, do you have a second one we haven't heard yet? House. House. House? A house would be incorrect. Oh. So, I will ask everybody in your various schools how many. I'm going to read them off, so check your list, okay? We have the tree, the puzzle piece, the guy walking, the paper clip, the clock, the bird, the umbrella, the water. It's just little waves. You might have said it was a mustache. Um, a light bulb, a phone, a car, a push pin, a key, an envelope, a lightning strike, and a bike. How many of you got half of them right? Eight. Anybody get more than eight? Anybody, somebody got more than eight? Do we have anybody at, at uh, Berkeley and Slater? Did anybody get nine? Berkeley, let's go to you. Did anybody get nine or more? Yeah, it looks like we've got four people here that did. All right. Woo! Well done. Woo How, what's the highest number? What's your highest number at Berkeley? Uh, 13. Thirteen. Yep. Whoa. Okay, well, you can come now give this talk <laughs> because I could have gotten about five. So here's the total, total shot at that. Now we're going to do one more of these, and this is I'm going to have to get the help of the guys out there on the board because this has to go by very fast. So I'm going to put up some arrows, and I'm going to put up uh, what direction they are and what box they're in. Again, there are 16 boxes. Okay, you guys are going to take a, this is going to be on the screen like three seconds. You're going to take a visual snapshot of it, and then I'm going to give you some choices. So you want to remember what box they're in and which way the arrow is pointing. And go. And Stop. <laughs> which box they were in, which way the arrow was pointing. The powers of observation. It's actually very fun to go out there and listen to the conversation at dinner at the next table instead of the one at your table. OK, so here's your choice. Is it A, B, C, or D? I'm going to put up a vote here at St. James the Infinitely Greater. How many say A? How many say B? We have maybe half at B. How many say C? We have more than half at C. How many say D? We have zero for D. How about out there at Berkeley. Come in, Berkeley. Come in, Berkeley. We had mostly C. What's mostly your majority? C. The mostly majority C. is mostly C. Well, that would be because it is C. <laughs> well done. 
But that's the whole game, is to go out and see what's out there that we all see and see it differently. The idea is to not see only what everyone sees, but also what they don't see. So here are some more challenges and puzzles for you. How many words do you see? Don't be bashful. Speak up. How many words? Any words? Two. two? What are the two words? Optical illusion. Optical illusion. Optical in yellow, illusion in color. Can you make your eyes do that and see that? That's what we do as writers. We want to see not just one, but both. Okay, Berkeley and Slater, keep your eyes out. Hopefully this will work at a distance. We are transmitting from St. Louis. <laughs> do you guys see the gray circles? Everybody see the gray circles? Good, because they aren't there. <laughs> Your optical nerve draws a gray circle between the corners of the squares. If you slowly move your eyes around that, they will disappear and reappear. Everybody see that? That is the optical illusion. That is what I'm trying to see as a writer. I'm trying to see the gray circles that actually aren't there, but make you believe they're there. Because my job is to bring you into a world like the Kingdom Keepers, which is five kids in Disney World after dark, and put you right into that park with me at 2 o'clock in the morning and scare your shorts off. So what are the two forces that work in any story? They grind against each other, whether it's Harry Potter or um, any number of stories. What are the two? It goes back to ancient times, you of greater St. Jamesians. Um, uh, good, and evil. good and evil. Good and evil. Can you see the two existing within each other? <laughs> no. Now can you? Yes. Evil in white, good in black. OK, so check this one out. Ready for a new one? What do you see? A frog. Oh, well, just go home. <laughs> so you also see a horse. Wiseacre, have you seen this before, or did you actually see it? Wow! We've got some smart kids here today. So my job is to see the frog, but also see the horse, and bring you that horse. Then I sit down and I write. How do you structure a story? There are three elements to any story, three pieces of a story. You guys know what those are? How about out in Berkeley? Anybody know what the three pieces of a story are? The sections, if you will? Have a seat. Uh, hold on here. OK. I'm holding. Doug's going to give it a try. Beginning, middle, and end. Beginning, middle, and end. Gold star to Berkeley. Slater, we're still wondering if you actually exist. <laughs> Beginning, middle, and end. So there are rules, believe it or not, to the beginning, the middle, and an end. That one of the big mistakes all of us make as writers is just jumping into a story, saying, I know, there'll be this unicorn, and the unicorn's tail's going to catch on fire, and I'm just going to start writing. Because you get into a story, and it's fun, and it's compelling, and you have no idea where it's going. Now, it's fun to write from a place where you don't know all the answers. I get that. But you want to have thought through the beginning, the middle, and the end, at least in a big umbrella kind of way, or you will get halfway into your story and throw it across the room because you can't figure out where it's going to go. So these are the guidelines. They're not rules. They're not formulas. But they're guidelines for the beginning, the middle, and the end. In the beginning, we typically learn quickly who's in the story. There is an inciting moment. Does anybody know what I mean by an inciting moment? It's the moment that kind of sparks your story. Generally in a story, you're going from one place to another, and something triggers that movement early on. A house catches on fire. Somebody disappears. 
A dragon shows up in the village. Whatever you're writing about, the kid falls off his bicycle. The kid gets a new bicycle. There's an inciting moment that sets our story because most stories have an ordinary world that they start in and they change into an extraordinary world. It doesn't mean it's filled with magic or anything. It just means it's different. The brother comes home from the war. The school wins the tournament, whatever it is. So in the beginning, we meet the characters. We meet where the story is set. We find out what this inciting moment is, what's going to change us from the ordinary world to the extraordinary world. And most of all, we find out what's at stake. What does the hero or heroes of the story have to lose or have to win? Something has to push them forward. And at the end of the beginning is often a conflict moment between the good and evil forces. No matter how small, if it's a romantic comedy, it may be that the boy and the girl have a tussle and they're angry at each other. It may be something that simple. It may be that somebody gets detention in the school. Whatever is at the heart of the story. And we get to the middle. In the middle of the story, we complicate the story. New things happen. There's often a spot where the guy, if it's a hero or the girl, if she's the heroine, learns the tools of this mission he or she is on. If it's a romantic comedy, those tools may be how to dance. They may be how to flirt. They could be anything. If it's a, if it's a dragon story, the guy learns how to use the sword and the shield. And by the end of the middle, there's a big confrontation. If you think about Harry Potter, it's where Harry and Voldemort almost always in all of those stories go into a big, big conflict. And in the Kingdom Keepers stories, where I have the Disney villains pitted against these five kids who can get into Disney World after dark, there's usually one of the villains who steps forward and really threatens the kids near the end of the middle. And finally, we get into the end of the story, where things start to resolve. We get rid of the subplots and the smaller stories so we can focus on the big main story we've been dealing with. If you think about Harry Potter or the Kingdom Keepers, usually most of even the heroes fall away and it leaves one person up against one villain because that's a very dramatic piece. It's a very easy way to illustrate good against evil is to make it me against you. Ah! Um, instead of army against army, although if it's a big army story, that's also fine. Um, most important about any story, and if you take anything away from this, take this away, is that at the end of the story, the hero or heroes or heroine or heroines have to learn something or take something away. They have to win or lose something. If it's a tragedy, they lose. If it's a good drama, they win. But you have to have that element. You can't just do everything and they walk out of the room. They have to win the cell phone. They have to win the chalice. They have to kill the dragon. They have to fall in love. They have to fall out of love. There has to be something. It may be that at the beginning of the story, they're afraid of heights. By the end of the story, they've climbed up this huge ladder to fight somebody. They've overcome their fear of heights. It can be any of these things, but you can't have a story where there's no win, there's no takeaway. That's where the reader, and you know how you've been to movies and you've walked out and somebody said, how do you like it? And you go, meh. You know, it's, it was fun, but I don't know. That's usually because there isn't a strong takeaway at the end. You don't come out feeling like, yeah, he did it, or oh, she lost it. You just come out of there going, well, I mean, it was 90 minutes of action, but I didn't really feel much. So what we try to do is make sure there's something taken away. We report and we write. And the writing is really hard and long. I write draft after draft after draft of my stories. It's the fun part in that you've gotten out of this preparation area of knowing the beginning, the middle, and the end, and you finally get to create your story. But the best thing to remember, I'm working with a middle school now called the Principia School, and the best thing to remember in your story crafting is keep your thoughts short. Write eight word sentences, ten word sentences. I had a student turn in a piece just this week 
And his, one of the sentences was 75 words long, which is, you know, like four score and seven years ago times 20. Um, it's too much. So write shorter, more compact ideas. Don't go heavy on the adjectives and adverbs. Use them sparingly. Tell your story. Move your story forward. <coughs> I've had the most fun with the Kingdom Keeper series because when Disney came to me, I, I normally kill people for a living, <laughs> but I do it on paper, not, not in reality. I write thrillers and mysteries and suspense novels, and Disney came to me and said, hey, could you write one of these aimed at a slightly younger audience set inside our theme parks? And I said, well, you know, I'm kind of a, a research freak. I like to go out and observe and collect ideas and put them all into a story. So if I was going to do that, I would need full access to your theme parks. They said, what? And I said, I would need full access to your theme parks. And they said, well, we don't give people full access to our theme parks. And I said, okay, well, cool, you know. Um, I really can't do it without that. And about a month later, the phone rang, and it was my editor-to-be at Disney, and she said, I talked them into it. You have full access at our theme parks. So I carry with me a VIP card that gets me into any Disney property around the world whenever I want to go. And I can go after hours. And when I go after hours, an Imagineer, a Disney Imagineer, which are the people that create the attractions, they tour me around. So I have like the coolest job in the world because I go there at 4 or 5 in the morning. The park is shut down. And I get to go into the rides, walk around the attractions when they're shut down. Then they turn them on for me. I get to ride them as many times as I want, making notes and observing. And then I go back and I write about it. So for me, the thrill was I got to go to Walt Disney World something like 20 times and basically have private tours of the park after hours. The first place I went to was Small World. Have any of you ever been to Small World? It's this ride with like 2,000 dolls, and they sing this obnoxious song. <laughs> They're all from all these different countries, and they go, it's a small world after all. It's a small world after all. And it just goes on and on and on. It happens to be a ride I really like. But when I went there, you know, here are the dolls, these cute little things, and they, they spin around and they sing and they have all sorts of fun. And then I get to go there and it's 5 o'clock in the morning. It's not all pretty. The lights are turned off. There's no music. Thank goodness. And the dolls are all stuck where they are because they aren't turned on doing their little fancy dances. So it looked more like this. It was spooky. And I'm in there, one scene, two scenes, three scenes, and I'm looking over this way, and two of the dolls step forward. And I jumped about eight feet out of the boat, landed back down next to my Imagineer, and he said, what's with you? And I went, did you not see that? Two of the dolls just moved. And he said, Ridley, the ride is shut off. And I said, dude, two of the dolls just moved. And he said, I was out of my mind, but I was not. I saw those dolls move, and I wrote in my little author's notebook for observation, two of the dolls moved. Well, I went back to write a scene about the five kingdom keepers in Magic Kingdom after dark, about two in the morning. They're running away from the Disney villains and trying to hide. They're looking for this answer to a puzzle, and they end up in Small World. And it's pitch black. The dolls are all frozen, there's no music, and they're in about the third scene, and two of the dolls move. And then two more move. And then all of the dolls move, like frozen little puppets. And they start walking toward the water, and they dive in, and they attack the boats that the kids are in. And the kids are screaming and beating against the dolls, and that's my version of what it's like to be in Disney World after dark, because I saw them move. Now, before you lock me up and put me in a straitjacket, I have since been interviewed by a radio station, and the guy at the radio station had also once been inside Small World after dark, and he saw four of the dolls move, so I'm not that wacky. I also got to go to Splash Mountain. Splash Mountain is this very cool ride that goes through a beginning, a middle, and an end. 
because each attraction at Disney World, unlike Six Flags and other places, they all tell a story. You're not aware of it, but you're always going through a beginning, a middle, and an end. At Splash Mountain, the, the beginning is getting thrown into this extraordinary world. The cactuses are like nine feet tall. They're big, weird animals. It's a whole different place than you've been. Then you get into the middle of it, and you're in this flat Br'er Rabbit zone. You're in your little weird boat. You're bombing along, and it's flat. There's spooky music. There are these coyotes and foxes. It feels it's that complication of story. It gets darker and more desperate, which is the whole point of the middle part of the story. And then you go down that chute, which is an incredibly steep water chute where I personally scream my brains out because I don't like steep water chutes, um, but my family loves them. And you get the final dramatic moment, that re resolution of story. Uh, when I went through it, I went through it with a guy named Wayne. And Wayne was this old white-haired dude who knew everything about Walt Disney World. He had been there from the beginning. He had run Splash Mountain for 30 years. And every question I asked, he could answer. He told me the lore and the myths about the park, what rides do come alive at night. There are, there are ghost stories throughout that park that have been reinforced year after year forever. Um, it was amazing. And so by the end of this two and a half hours I spent with the guy, I said, you know, I have this older guy in my story, and maybe I could use your name for him instead of the name I've got. And he said, wow, that would be an honor. So if you go to this day, if you go to Splash Mountain in the Magic Kingdom, and I get emails from kids all the time who do this, and you get put on one of these flutes in Splash Mountain, one of these um, metal logs, you'll, your chances are you'll look over and the guy's name tag says Wayne. And that's Wayne from the Kingdom Keepers. And kids say, wait, wait, are you Wayne from the Kingdom Keepers? And he goes, heck yes. And then he signs their maps and stuff. By the end of the um, first book, I, encounter, I, I decided to use a really amazing piece of research, observation, that I had done on one of my visits, maybe my fifth or sixth visit. They took me underneath the Magic Kingdom. It turns out when they built it, it was swampy. So they lifted it 25 feet. The whole park, acres and acres and acres. And to do that, they built these tunnels and then backfilled and put asphalt on it and started building the Magic Kingdom. The result is there's a mile and a half of tunnels under the Magic Kingdom. And I got to go down in there. It's called the Utilidor. And there was, among other things, they have all these golf carts bringing the cotton candy and everything back and forth. And the characters are walking along. You get to see Minnie and Mickey and shake hands with them. But underneath there, there were these huge pipes. And I said, what is with the four-foot pipes? And the guy said, Ridley, have you ever seen trash being wheeled out of the Magic Kingdom? And I said, no. And he said, that's because we take our trash out in a very special way. Up top, and he took me back up to the level that we're always in when we're in Magic Kingdom, and he showed me this. I opened this thing that looked like a submarine hatch, and it's going It was a trash chute. They suck the trash out of the Magic Kingdom. They drop a giant bag into it. It goes <laughs> And it gets sucked out a mile and a half and spit out into the hugest trash compactor you have ever seen. Big enough, when, it's, when, when the brick ends up smashed, it fits on the back of a huge truck. It's so big. Um, but I'm thinking, because I'm a writer and I'm observing, trash bag? kid, trash bag, kid, that a kid in a cannonball is about the same size and weight as a big heavy bag of trash. So by the end of the first Kingdom Keepers books, the kids are doing cannonballs into the Disney trash system and getting sucked out of the park. Not recommended because it would kill you, but not in my books because the kids are holograms. For the second book, I got to go to Animal Kingdom. And in Animal Kingdom, there is this amazing ride called Expedition Everest. It's a $100 million roller coaster. 
And again, I got to walk through it when it was turned off. I don't really like roller coasters. And we walked the whole thing. And we got to the end of it, and I took all these notes. And I got to the end of it, and the guy who had built the whole thing said, now we're going to turn it on and you can ride it. And I said, that's very, very nice of you, but I don't do roller coasters. And the guy said, I, I got up at 4.30 in the morning, Ridley. You are doing my roller coaster. <laughs> so they put me on the roller coaster alone, and this thing goes like 40 miles an hour. It blows your hair off. And we're bombing through, and suddenly I see this. And in front of me is a broken track. And I go, no! And it skids right up to the thing and stops. Then it backs up through the dark at 40 miles an hour. And at that point, I'm ready to lose my breakfast. And this giant creature reaches down out of the dark and goes, Hurrah! at which point I needed to change my underwear. And it was one of the most horrific things I've ever been through. But I put the kids through it in the second Kingdom Keepers book. I also got to go to the bat enclosure. Now, in the bat enclosure, there are foot and a half sized fruit bats, alive living things that look all cuddly and sweet when you see them close up. Oh, it's just such a cute little animal. Oh, until you see them face on. And then you go, no. In the Second Kingdom Keepers, the Kingdom Keepers have to go inside the bat enclosure with all of those bats and dodge them as they climb a wall. For the third, I went to Epcot. And I got to do all sorts of cool things in Epcot. In Epcot, they have early morning Segway tours where families can ride Segways through the park. So these kids bomb around, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, come the overtakers, the Disney villains, on Segways, chasing after them. For the fourth book, I went to Disney Hollywood Studios. And again, had unbelievable experiences being in there at 4 and 5 in the morning, observing, observing, observing. For the fifth and sixth books, I went on to the Disney Cruise Line. And they let me into these ships in places that even the people that work on the ships have never been. I was getting toured by this woman who said, this is so cool, I've never been here. We went to the engine room, we went into the ship's hospital, the crew quarters, all over the ship. And I got to write all about it for the fifth and sixth books. So what do we do once you've gathered all this information? You sit down and write. And to write, you use your skills of description. And some of you, I think most of you, if not all of you, have done my description piece, where you see a face of somebody you know, I think it's Taylor Lautner, Taylor Swift, Lady Gaga, and Orlando Bloom. And then you use your writing skills to try to tell me who you're seeing without actually naming them or using jewelry or any of that. So what we're going to do now is see how good or how bad you were. These were the people you were describing. On the left, Taylor Lautner. On the right, upper, is Taylor Swift. Lower left, Lady Gaga, and then Orlando Bloom. The skill in writing is not to use 75 words in a sentence. It's to use specific detail and catch the person's interest, catch their eye, make them see what you need to see. Every day, I sit down and I try to make you see what I'm seeing. And all I have is words. So we're going to see how well all of you did. We're going to start with Paul Lawrence Dunbar Middle School. And this, what I want you to do, whether you're at Berkeley or Slater or here at the greatest, most incredible St. James incarnate victory school that has ever happened, um, the minute you know about whom is being written, you raise your hand. We'll see how much detail plays a part in writing. Her hair is as straight as steamrolled plot of asphalt. Well, here in St. James, everybody has their hands up because it is Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga. She looks very serious with her eyes staring into your soul. Her long nose cascades down her face like a round caterpillar. 
crawling down a branch. That's, that's quite a nose there, Lady Gaga. Her black witch's cat eyeliner engulfs her eyes like a black hole. I love this. Her features almost unreal like a plastic Barbie doll. That was written by Dathan down in Fort Myers, Florida. A great job. So, again, raise your hand when you know who it is. His messy, shaggy hair is a dark brown. His, and we've got about half the people here, and we've got about half the people in, is that? Slater. That's Slater. Slater, Slater, we can see you, Slater. Who is it? Slater, who is it? <laughs> Name the person what, that's being written about. It's Orlando Bloom. That's very good. His facial expression looks like he's serious and questioning. He's squinting. That's written by Hiram. Good job, Hiram. Okay, another one. She looks calm and peaceful, like she's perfectly happy. Is that enough detail to know exactly who it is? We've got a few hands, but not ever. Her hair is smooth and sleek. We've got more. It looks shiny and silky. We've got almost everybody because it is Lady Gaga. But you see how detail in the first sentence, maybe we weren't so sure. By the second, we did. Her dark eyes look powerful and staring. Her chin is flawless, as if it's made to cover her features perfectly. Let's hope so, because when you don't have your skin, it really gets messy. Um, her face is relaxed, but looks like she's ready for anything. She looks in charge. That is Hannah in Babbler Elementary. Okay, remember, raise your hand when you know. Her, his hair is a little messy and he looks tired. Okay, we don't have everybody. His eyebrows are large. He has short hair that is brown that covers the top and everybody's hands go up. It is Taylor Lautner. He also looks a little lazy and bored. The picture looks kind of like a mug shot. <laughs> that is Allie at the Principia School. Hey, Principia. I should be there teaching. Uh, a new one. Raise your hand when you've got it. Her face is as peachy as a baby's bum. We've got one. Who is it? It is Lady Gaga. Her snowy, her snowy white hair is as sleek and straight as a new car. There's an interesting analogy. Um, her eyes are like fiery marbles. This is fabulous. This is Devon at Blessed Pope John the 23rd Catholic School. I don't know how you fit that on like a logo, but it's possible. Okay, a couple more. Her hair's medium length hanging down barely past her shoulders. It's golden blonde and curls in spirals like a pig's tail. And it is <coughs> Taylor Swift. Her eyes are bright blue like a sunny summer afternoon sky. This is fun. And her, hair, her, her eyebrows are raised in an interested stare. She's also, uh-oh, wearing a... And that is Michaela at Slater. At Slater! Let's give Slater a round of applause. Woo! Yay, Slater! Here's one written in past tense. She stood there with her dirty blonde hair with curls that would flow with the ocean. Who is it? Detail tells a story. Detail sparks our interest. That is Natalia, Mount Dora, Florida. And these are from some place called St. James the Greater. His jet black hair is tangled like overgrown weeds past his ears. How cool a sentence is that? Who is it? I have no idea because they don't say here. No, it's Orlando Bloom. The gaze upon his face looks directed towards someone or something in the distance. His nose has a defined bridge. His goatee is thin. That certainly would have done it right away. Decreasing in size. Let's hope it doesn't expand in size. The eyebrows above his dark brown eyes are dark. And like most of his other hair, very fine and minute. This picture I will never forget. That's very cool. That's Connor. And this person's hair is blonde and straight as an arrow. Lady Gaga. That's a good detail. Her eyes look into the air. That's good. 
We want eyes looking in air because underwater they're hard to see. She has a long nose like Pinocchio. This poor lady gets really beat up for her nose, doesn't she? <laughs> it's like Pinocchio or a caterpillar. We apologize to <laughs> Lady Gaga. We know you're coming to St. Louis, Lady Gaga, and we won't say anything about your nose once you're here. She looks as if she's confused. <laughs> oh, we don't mean this. But that's Jacob, and that's a great job. Anyway, you guys get the idea, I hope, that the more detail you put into your story, the better. The most important element when you write a story is revision. And you will think that you can write a piece and turn it in for homework, right? And you will get a pretty crummy grade. If you write it a second time, revising it, shortening your sentence, finding better verbs, getting out of your own way, making your story more compact, it will go up a half a grade. A C will become a C plus. If you do that twice, it will become a B. If you do that three or four times, it will become an A. And it's just that simple. All the way through high school, it's that simple. I have written and published 43 novels. That's a lot of novels. My most recent novel, The Risk Agent, that came out in June, which is one of my adult thrillers, I rewrote not four times, not five, six, seven, eight, but nine times. I wrote 6,000 pages to get a 500-page book published. Dave Berry, who's a really funny, great writer, I've had the honor to work with and be his co-writer on a number of books. Dave and I wrote a series called Peter and the Star Catchers about how a young boy became Peter Pan. This is an actual page from a first draft of Peter and the Star Catchers. By the time Dave and I sent it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, I would edit him, he would edit me, I would edit him, he would edit me, I would edit him, back and forth six, eight, ten times, we would eventually get to a finished draft. And this is what the finished draft looks like. In color, you will see red words that were cut out and blue that were left in, I hope. There it is. You see the color? Against the blue background, it's a little hard, but what you're seeing there, the white is the original. That's all that's left, or a few thes, an at, smaller swords and pistols, everything else was rewritten. The art of writing is not in writing, it's in rewriting. You observe, you report, and you revise. And that, I hope, makes us all better writers. Thank you for having me, and now I'm going to turn it open to some questions. Thank you. Oh, come on, St. James Greater. Thank no, you much, Mr. That's Pearson. Right. Thank you very much. I think, um, <laughs> let's all the questions you're going to hear today were Beauty sent. before goatee. All the questions you're going to hear today were some of the ones sent in advance from all the schools across the country or watching us via the internet and video conference. Kiki, you've got the first one. Go for it. Hi, my name is Kiki. I'm a sixth grade student at St. James the Greater School, and I'm asking this question for Thomas from Babbler Elementary School in Wildwood, Missouri. When did you get started writing, and why did you start? When did I get started writing, and why did I start? Uh, when I was 10 years old, I'm, if you can believe this, I'm the youngest of three kids. <laughs> uh, and when I was 10 years old, my sister, who's three years older than me, and my brother, who's six years older than me, uh, had learned how to type. They'd taken a summer course in typing. This was way before computers. And I didn't want to be the only kid who couldn't type in our family. So I borrowed my sister's book, and I taught myself how to type. And I had nothing to type. Uh, so I started making up stories. And I would sit at my, it was really as a means to keep my fingers typing correctly. I'm a very fast typer. Uh, so I wrote probably 40 or 50 stories in the next couple summers and times off when there were vacations. Uh, then I did, you know, high school and college and was real busy with all of that. And I came out of college and I really wanted to be a musician. So I spent several years on the road as a musician and I wrote all the songs and all the words. And eventually that became kind of compact and I wanted to write bigger stories, so I started writing books. But it was a really long process, but I actually started younger than you guys are. Very cool. Tyson? 
Hi, my name is Tyson. I am a seventh grade student at St. James the Greater School, and I am asking this question for Kevin M. from St. Paul's Lutheran School in Orange, California. Do you have a special routine when you write a book? Do I have a special routine? Hi, Orange, California. Um, yes, I outline my books, and I create a three parts, <laughs> a beginning, a middle, and an end. What else do I do? I revise, I observe, I have a daily schedule because I love writing and I do it for a living. I start at about 7.30 in the morning and I write till about 4.30 in the afternoon. I have two wonderful assistants who do all my business for me so I can focus on my writing. But when they invite me down to Disney World after dark, although my assistants come with me, I go because I love that part. <laughs> um, but I write basically seven days a week. I write about four hours a day on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, last night I worked until 9 p.m. because I knew I was coming here today and I'd be a little bit behind. I read all the time. The most important thing for any writer, whether you're just writing for school to get better grades or you're writing to try to be a professional writer, is reading. You have to read, read, read. In this course I'm helping to teach at the Principia School, there was a student who wrote this amazing paper, and I'm teaching a few sixth graders, a few seventh graders, and a few eighth graders. I'm doing this as a volunteer thing. And one of the papers, one of the short stories, was just amazing. So I pulled the girl over. It turned out she was a sixth grader. And I said, your story is one of the best in this whole thing. How much do you read? What, what did you read, for instance, this summer? And she said, oh, I kept track of what I read this summer. I read 16 books this summer. And I went, oh. And that sort of explained why she was so good. You just have to read. Rachel? Hi, my name is Rachel. I'm a seventh grade student at St. James the Greater School. And I'm asking this question for students from Rich Meadows Elementary School in Ellisville, Missouri. Where do you get your ideas and your inspiration for your books? Where do I get my ideas and inspiration for my books? This time of year, I get most of my ideas at Walmart. No, no. Um, <laughs> for Peter and the Star Catchers, I was reading to my daughter, who was at the time five years old. She's 15 now, and she's very cute, guys. Um, and we were reading Peter Pan. And we were about six pages into the book, and she put her hand across the book and said, hey, Dad, how did Peter meet Captain Hook in the first place? And I went, oh my gosh, that's its own story. P how come Peter can fly? Why does he never grow old? Why does he want to detach from his shadow? All these unanswered questions. And I think that's the point of observation. There are a million stories out there. You just have to keep your eyes open, and they will start popping up to you as stories. I can watch, literally, I can watch a car go down a street and think up a story. There are just a zillion stories out there, so you keep your eyes open, and all of it is inspiring if you let it be. A friend of mine, a guy named Stephen King, this guy who writes horror, wrote a story once about a car that can come alive and kill people. Now, how crazy is that? But I'm telling you, if you read Christine, that novel, you won't get in a car for a week mm. because he makes it come alive. And that's what we do as writers. We see something perfectly normal, like Disney World, and we make it come alive. We've got just about four minutes left. We're going to do two more questions. And Minnie, we're going to go to your question next. Hi, my name is Minnie. I am a seventh grade student at St. James the Greater School, and I'm asking this question for Brittany from St. Paul's Lutheran School in Orange, California. Do you do anything different between writing books for adults and writing books for children? And, it is, and is the process the same? That's a great, great question. Um, I, uh, do I do things different when I write for adults or younger readers? I don't write for children, I write for younger readers. And I'm blessed because a lot of adults read my fiction for younger readers. I do nothing different. I want to tell a compelling story with a... I want to do a lot of... And if I do that well, it's the same for everybody. What I think what would be the difference is my adult novels are a little tough. So if you were going to a movie of an adult novel that I write, they'd probably be R-rated. You know, they're probably more for a 16 or 17-year-old. 
uh, because they have some tough things. Sometimes they have some blood and violence and stuff. And, and my younger readers' stuff are PG or PG-13, if you were rating it as a movie. But I have learned, because I have kids, if I tried to write down to kids, you would hate it because you're smarter than I am, honestly. So if I try to go, oh, well, I'm going to write real simple stuff, you'd go, this is simple, stupid stuff. So no, I try to write, if anything, for the younger readers, I try to write more engaged, more, more energized fiction because I, I want you loving my books. Kenny, we got about a minute left, Kenny. Okay, let's talk really fast. <laughs> Hi, That's too slow. <laughs> go for it, Kenny, you're fine. Hi, my name is Kenny. I'm a sixth grade student at St. James's Greater School, and I'm asking this question for Kara F. at St. Paul's Lutheran School in Orange, California. What advice would you give to someone who had an interest in becoming an author? That's a great question. What advice would I have for somebody who wants to become an author? Um, for the first, second, and third thing is read, read, read. You just can't read enough. And read what you like to read. I am hereby giving you permission to abandon books. Okay, look, when a teacher tells you you have to read a book, you have to read a book. But when you're reading a book for your own pleasure, even one of mine, <laughs> if you get 30, 40, you've got to give a book 30 or 40 pages. But if you get 30 or 40 pages in and it just isn't working for you, no one says you have to finish that book. Even if somebody bought it as a gift, put it aside, find something you like. Some people like reading nonfiction about how engines are made. Some people like reading about kids in Disney World after dark. But make sure you don't give up on reading because a book or two isn't your way. The other thing to do is to sit in a chair, pick amount of time, 30 minutes, whatever it is, stay there and write. Whether it's once a week, five times a week, that's up to you. But don't make an excuse to get up and, and go watch Phineas and Ferb. Put that away for a minute. Sit there and write. Focus on writing. And then, when you reach your 30-minute mark or hour mark, or for me, it's eight hours a day mark, then you can walk away. But give yourself that focused dedication. Thank you very much, Mr. Pearson. Thanks, everybody. Thank you to St. James the Greater School, to everybody here who's made it possible for us to be part of this program. Thanks to everybody who joined us over the web today or, of course, via video conference. The archive of this program will be up and running in about a week to 10 days. So don't forget to go to our website to check it out. And make sure you see this man in all his glory on the archive version as well. As always, it's a great pleasure to be part of HECTV Live, even with a psychotic author like Ridley Pearson. <laughs> we'll see you again soon. Bye, everybody.